each and every one of you all again tonight. I trust that you all have had uneventful days. You understand what I mean when I say that. If you will take God's word and find it, you will. The book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 3. The book of Daniel, chapter 3. It is a joy to get to come be back with you all again this evening. It is uh, it is with a, a very burdened heart that I come to you this evening. Uh, Daniel chapter 3. You're going to notice uh, something here in just a few moments. There, again, a very familiar passage of Scripture. And this uh, passage is I believe we can say without a doubt that the potential for us is some of the things that we will see here in this passage. That we too are facing some things that are similar to this and the reality is is that we should never be surprised that the Lord has promised, He has said, hasn't He, that if we are going to follow after Him, that in this world, in this life, that there will be tribulation, there will be troubles. This is not where we find and where that we have our best life now. This world is not where our best life is. Our best life is in Christ. Our best life is uh, in a future eternity with Him. This is, in essence, if the the hymn writer is right, and I believe that uh, the hymn writer is right, whenever the, the, they wrote in the sweet by and by. There is a reality of that, isn't it? That our, our hope, our, fit, our fixed eyes are upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that we are headed to the sweet by and by. But the reality is, is for us now, we are living in this moment. We are living in this time, and the truth is, I guess you could say is, is we are not in the sweet by and by. We are in the nasty now and now. But we are headed to the sweet by and by, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you come to this passage of Scripture, and the reality is, is whenever that you come to it, uh, helping us to understand some of the context of what's taking place and what is going on can serve us very well and help us to understand what's taking place. And so understand that this is a, 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 a time of captivity. That the children of Israel have gone into uh, captivity, Babylonian captivity. And here they are that they are under the, the, the reign, if you will, that has captured them is a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And whenever the Babylonians, they're so ruthless, when they would come into a territory, when they would come into a nation, they would literally obliterate anyone and everyone that they were not going to take captive. There, there was a rarity. Anyone that they would take captive and to take back with them, they would literally annihilate their families. And so we, are, we come to this book and there is one Daniel that we all know, right? There are multiple others that would have been taken captive, but there are three other individuals that we are all familiar with. And we know them by their Babylonian names. Who are they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so that is actually what we are going to look at tonight. We're going to look at these three, three of these four individuals. And we are seeing them, and we, we are going to notice some things about them. Understand this, that they would have been taken captive, and their mothers, their fathers, their, 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 their brothers, their sisters, they would have been put to death. Why would they do such a thing? Well, the reason is, is for fear, of course. The other reason is to give them nothing to go back to. They, get, they, they would, they would be, break down the individual. They would break down the psyche. They, they, they were telling them that you have nothing to go back home to. And so in so doing, just listen to us. Just, just adhere to what it is that we have to say. And so you know 
this story so well. I want you to know, precious friend, that this world is growing very dark. It is growing gloriously dark. It, if, if so, there was a noose on a tree, that noose is tightening. That noose is, is ever tightening. The day, this is a day of intense spiritual warfare. And I want you to understand something, is the reality is, is that many people do not realize that aspect right there that I just said. All we see are the physical aspects and, and attempting to overcome these physical aspects by physical means. But I want you to understand something. These are, are spirit, is a spiritual war that is actually taking place that is manifesting itself in physical means and physical ways. And the answer is not physical means. The answer is spiritual means. The hope for the world is only the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The hope for the world is, is, is only the world coming to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. You say, well, Matt, why do you say that? Because it is through Christ and Christ alone that hearts are changed. And whenever hearts are changed, individuals' lives are changed. And when individual lives are changed, then communities are changed. And then counties are changed, cities are changed, states are changed, nations are changed, the world is changed through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How? One soul at a time. That's only the answer that there is. And so we need to be aware and we need to see how is it that as a follower of Christ we live in dark times. How is it that we can live in dark days? How is it that we can live in intense spiritual warfare? How, how is it? How, how, how do we do that? It's not through compromise. There was a theologian, a pastor, in the, in the early centuries of the church, and his name was Athanasius. And Athanasius was a strong Christian witness. He took strong stands out of his love and reverence for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not arrogant, yet he was called arrogant. He, 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 he was not mean, but he was called mean. They called him narrow-minded, Pastor. They called him stubborn. They said that he just needed to bend and go along to get along. The emperor at the time, Emperor Theodosius the Great, said to Athanasius, who appeared before him one time, said, Athanasius, the entire world is against you. They hate you. They despise you. The, the entire world, Athanasius, is against you. And Athanasius stood flat-footed and looked at the emperor and stated that Athanasius is against the world. This world is no friend to you precious follower of Christ. It is not simply, you can, you can give an inch, but I promise you, you give an inch, the enemy will take hundreds of miles. There is no bend. There is no retreat. It takes guts. It takes grit. It takes courage to stand. And understand this, there may be times you must stand Absolutely alone. You must stand and be called arrogant. You must stand and be called narrow-minded. You must stand and be looked upon as stubborn. You must stand and everyone else be against you. But understand this. The Lord Jesus Christ, if you know Him, this is not your home. Heaven is your home. You're just passing through now. And you are to mimic and you are to point other people to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the need for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How is it that we stand? How is it that we can live in these fiery, dark times, if you will? I want to show you three individuals tonight. And we're going to walk through, we're going to look at this passage, and I want you to see how that they were found faithful for the fire. Did you hear what I said? They were found faithful for for the fire. Let's stand in honor and reverence for the reading of God's Word. And we'll read the first seven verses and pray. And then you can be seated. 
Notice the text says, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 1, the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. In other words, 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. Notice he says, and he set it up in the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, and the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of all the provinces were gathered together into the in, in, unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud to, and, and aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that act what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, the, 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 the sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time when the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, uh, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Let's pray. Father, take your word. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Lord, your word is truth. Shine it upon us. Sanctify us with your word. Wash us with your word. Conform us with your word. Exhort us. Encourage us. Convict us. Shape us to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ from your word. And if one doesn't know you, Lord, as Lord and Savior today, may they come to know you before it's eternally too late. Help us to see how these real people in real time, in real situation, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faithfully followed you in the midst of dark times and dark days. Help us, Lord, to fix our eyes upon you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated. I stop right there because we need to kind of you know, get get going, I guess you would, with the text. I, I want you to understand that this is, sounds very familiar, doesn't it? I don't know if you noticed that, but as you look at this and, and you just kind of hit the pause button for a moment, you, you're already recognizing that trouble is looming. There's problems on the horizon. What do you do when you're commanded to go against not just your conscience, but what do you do when you're commanded to go against God's inspired, authoritative, all-sufficient Word? What do you do? And the answer is you do what the Word of God says to do. That is what you do. No matter the consequences, no matter what anybody else thinks or says. And to do so, you understand that there are consequences that follow for being obedient to the Lord. But He is faithful and He is true and He is good. Even though things may not be good, times might not be good, God is always good. God is always faithful. Even though I may not feel I may not feel His presence. I, I, I may not feel like it. I may not feel or seem like it. I can take God's Word and I can see that He is faithful and true. And He does not conflict His Word. He does not go against His Word. And so even when I do not feel like it, I can go to His Word and I can trust Him still because of His Word. I can rest assured that He has been. I can rest assured that, that, that He knows what He is doing. Even though things may look like a mess 
He knows about the mess and He's working all things together for my good ultimately. Notice what I did not say. He did not say that He is working all things together and that they are good in and of themselves. No. He will take the mess ups. He will take the hiccups. He will take the problems. He will take the pain. He will take all of that and He will ultimately work it together for good for His glory. I cannot understand that. But I rest in Him. We can rest in Him. No matter who sets in a mayoral office, no matter who sets in a governorship, no matter who sets in a presidency, we can rest assured God is on the throne. He knows absolutely what He is doing. As a matter of fact, this is a fulfillment of prophecy, what you are seeing take place here in the book of Daniel. God had told the people to repent. He had called them back to Himself, and yet what did they do? They still rebelled. They still rebelled, and He says to them, you will go into captivity for 70 years. You will look upon Me. You will see your need for Me. And that's where He gives that very famous quotation that many people placard on their walls or put up other places but don't understand the context that it's actually out of the context of judgment to the nation of Israel and that is that he knows the plans he has for them says the Lord plans to give them a future a future from what judgment a future from going into Babylonian captivity that He would bring them out because He has a future and a hope for them. Push pause, precious friend. Look right here. No matter what we face, no matter what we have going on in our lives, we can rest assured God knows what He's doing. We can rest assured that He is going to make things come to pass that nothing is going to thwart His plan. He knows what He is doing. He is absolutely on the throne. Listen, this is an egomaniac right here named Nebuchadnezzar. He is absolutely, positively, you see it right here, he thinks he is in absolute control. He, he is such an egomaniac that he builds a statue commemorating himself, commemorating the deities of the Babylonian gods that's 90 feet tall and nine feet wide, sets it up in the blazing sun in the middle of Dura there so that everyone, get this, he says all nations, all tongues, all people, are whenever they hear these things begin to play, they immediately are to fall down on their face and pay homage and worship and respect to Nebuchadnezzar and his deities. You see right here, there's a force behind the fire. There's a force behind the fire. And I want you to understand something. There's a force behind the force behind the fire. Satan himself is a, is a puppet master utilizing pagan ideologies, utilizing those that are against God, do not know God in order to bring about His plan. But God is on the throne. Amen. God knows absolutely what He is doing. Luther put it this way. He says, yes, the devil is there, but I want you to know He's God's devil. He is on a leash. Nothing touches your, your life or my life. Do you understand, follower of Christ? Nothing touches your life or my life, Spurgeon said, without it being filtered through the fingers of our great Savior first. God knows what He's doing. And somebody says, well, what's this got to do with me? Well, think about this. This is a picture also of what the Antichrist will do one day. This is a picture of what the Antichrist will do one day. So somebody says, you, you, you know, I, I, I don't have to worry about the Antichrist. I'm not going to be here. Well, you need to be aware. You need to understand what's taking place. You need to understand Scripture. You need to know how to handle Scripture. You need to know what, what's going on. You do know that to be true, but I need you to understand something. 1 John 2, verse 18 says this. The Apostle John says, Little children, it is the last time 
And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. Did you hear, did you hear that? Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. That is to say that the closer we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His coming, the closer it gets to the return of Christ, the more and more and more and more and more blatant opposition there is going to be to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more blatant opposition there is going to be to the things of God and to His Word. Does that sound familiar? There is a force behind this fire. You, 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 you have, we have right here in this story, pause, that these are real people in real time, in real situations. We have a tendency to read scripture and we think, oh, it's like Grimm's fairy tales. No, these are real people in real time, in real situations. This is not some cartoon. This is not some, so this is not some Marvel movie. These are real men. This is a real king. This is a real kingdom. These are real problems. And what do we find happening? The text says in verse 7, whenever the, he, the force, the king, gives the command, he gives the warning, he, gives, he puts pressure on them, he tells them what's going to take place, when it's going to take place, how it's going to take place, and what's going to take place and happen to them if they do not do what he tells them to do. Sound familiar? Revelation 13. Revelation 13 says this, and he does great wonder, so he maketh fire come out from heaven, this on earth in the sight of men, and deceives them that dwell on earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Long ago, back here in Babylon, this something similar took place. And there is coming a day when Antichrist himself, he will formulate an image and it will have the power, a satanic power will loom over it and allow it to be able to speak. And anyone that does not worship it, anyone that does not pay homage to it, here's what's going to happen. They will be put to death. That's what's going to take place. And so, what, what I'm trying to help us understand, there's a real man here named Nebuchadnezzar. There's a real problem that is looming. He absolutely is a hater of God. He hates uh, the Word of God. He hates the followers of God. He is against God. He is against Christ. He, he puts himself, in essence, in the place of the Savior. And what is the answer? What is it that he does? Notice what he does in verse 5. There is an emotional pressure. There is emotional pressure. There is emotional enticement. It says, at what time of year that you hear these instruments, the symphony begin to play, you are to fall down and to worship it. He will take this music, he will move upon their emotions, he will put pressure upon them, and they will be moved by this to worship, not the God of the universe, but they will worship and they will do everything to comply. There's not just an emotional enticement, there's social inducement. This is a social matter. Notice what the text says. Look back to verses 2 and 3. Notice he says this, Nebuchadnezzar the king sent for who? He calls for everybody. All the high powers, all the princes, all, all, all the power leaders, all the power platers, uh, all of them. And what, what happens when they're called for? Nobody rebels. Nobody takes a stand. Nobody does anything, John. Everybody shows up. Everybody goes along. Everybody gets along. He plays upon their emotions and they're socially now. They are left all alone. They're, everybody's doing it. Just, just get in line, right? Does that sound familiar? Everybody's got it going. Everybody's doing this. 
And if you don't fall in line, if you don't step in time, if you, if you don't do what that you're commanded to do, well, you're the oddball out. You, you, you're, you're looked down on. It's, but more than that, you're put to death. But that's not all. It's not just emotional. It's not just social. It's governmental. There's governmental enforcement on this. Notice what the text says in verse 6. And whoso falleth not down and worships the idol that worships the golden image, the golden statue, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, set up by Nebuchadnezzar, verse 6, that same hour shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. That is emotional, that is social, that is governmental pressure. All in what? You're not going to do it. You're not going to bow down and worship just like everybody else. Then understand this. Then you will not keep your life. You, you're, you're not going to keep your, your life. There's a man from an organization and he was once a member of a Bible-believing church. Now, he has left that organization. He has, he has, and, and he has accepted and said that he has deconstructed from what he calls to be the faith that he had been indoctrinated in as a young child. And he has liberated himself and now knows true freedom. You mark it down big, plain, and tall, precious freedom. When you decide to deconstruct, Satan will reconstruct for you. When you decide to deconstruct truth, and you look to manipulate it and look to hurdle over it and you look to throw it off and you look to run to run, run all over it and everything like that, Satan himself will reconstruct your faith for you and it will not be truth. It will be damnation and darkness. It will not be for freedom. It is actually enslaving you into bondage. It, it, it is not, some, somebody says, well, well it, it, why, why do they walk away? Why would they walk away from their faith? Well, First John talks about this. They went out from us because they were never of us. Someone that is looking for an exit and finds an exit, they've been looking for an exit for a long time. They've been looking for an excuse for a long time. People do not disbelieve for intellectual reasons. They do so for moral reasons. They do so because they say, I, I, in other words, they won't say it like this, but I want to be my own God. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I want to call the shots. I call the shots. I, I, no, nobody can, can be over me. I'm my own God. I'm my own king. I'm my own queen. And nobody, and, and you know what? So I'm going to do what? I, I reject this but I'm going to do this or I'm going to believe this because it supports and affirms everything that I already believe in anything and everything that I can hope and dream and aspire for because I want to be my own God and Savior. It doesn't work that way. There is one God. There is one Lord. There is one Savior and His name is Jesus. Amen. He is not a good way. He is not a nice way. He is not the best way. To forgiveness of sins and truth and salvation. He is the only way. And so what does that lead to? Well, what does that lead to? That leads to, in essence, calling good evil and evil good. It ultimately leads to calling right wrong and wrong right. And it is an emotional push. It is a social construct. It, 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 it is a governmental Bearing down it, as well in this text. And it leads what to? Spiritual defilement. It leads to spiritual defilement. Notice what he says in verse 6. And whoso followeth not down in worship. You have to make a decision. Are you going to worship the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your spirit, and all your strength, with every ounce of your being? Or are you going to serve yourself and live for yourself and live for the things that everybody else is doing? And Are you going to swim down or float downstream with all the dead stuff? Or are you going to swim against the stream because you've been made alive in Christ? 
Do you understand this? If you're in Christ, you were dead in trespasses and sins, floating down the stream of life, dead in sin with the driftwood, with the dead fish, with all the dead stuff. But the moment that you were regenerated, made alive in Christ, you were given life. And now you're going against that, and all of that is washing, beating against you. What do you do? Do you compromise? Do you choose to bow down at the bales of the world? Or will you and I follow after Christ and honor Christ? What do they do? You've heard about this. Do they deconstruct? Do they defile? Do they bend? Do they get scared? Well, let's pick up our reading and let's just see. Let's, let's notice what the text says. And, and wherefore, at that certain time, verse 8 says, that these Chaldeans... They came near and accused the Jews. And, and, and they, they spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou art, O king, have, have you made this decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the, uh, of the symphonic, the this, this symphony begins to play. When they begin to hear this symphony play, are they not to fall down and worship the golden image? And whoso not it doth not fall down and worship that, that, that he should be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace? Is, is that what you said, Keith? We know that's what you said. You, you made that declaration. And so I want you to understand, King. Listen, they, they see this about these Jews, and he says this. And there are certain Jews, verse 12, whom thou hast set over the affairs, the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are men that have notoriety now. These are men that have come out of Judaism, have come out of, out of Israel, and they've been taken captive. They have no home, they have no family, nothing to go back to, but, but, but they have the favor of the Lord on them. God has provided them a position in the government even. And notice what the text says. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage, did you see that? Underline that. In his rage and in his fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Well, what's going on, guys? Do you see the pressure here again? I spared your life. I, I, now, I've given you food. I've given you something to wear. I, I've put you in a position. Don't you know who I am? You're not going along. You're not complying. You're not willing to do this. Now if ye be ready, that at what time you hear the sound again of this symphony begin to play, all the instruments begin to play, the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psalter, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you will fall down and worship the image that I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you from my out of my hands? Hey, 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 where's your God going to be then? Don't you see? I hold your life in my hands. Just, just, just this one time. Come on, man. Just bow down here, just whenever that you hear it. And, and, and nobody's going to deliver you out of my hands. I'm the most powerful one that there is. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O, o Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Pause. In other words, here, here's a better rendering of this here. We do not need any time to think about this. We've already made up our mind. Precious friend, the time to make up your mind is not the moment that you're in the midst and facing the fire. You have to make a determination if and when this comes, when these situations take place in my life, when things are going awry, when stuff is happening, what am I going to do? Whom will we serve? Who will you bow to? Who will you live for? Verse 17. 
If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, let it be known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You have the force behind the fire. Now you have the faith for the fire. Do you understand that? And some people say, oh man, they had faith to get in the fire. No, their faith is what got them into the fire. Their faith, their following of the Lord, their belief in Him is what got them into the fire. There is no wiggle room. There's no straddling the fence here. There's no wringing of the hands here. This is absolute. And this is their eyes are fixed. That they are dead set. That they are all in right here. That they have this faith. And we look at this. Some people look at this and they say that is absolute foolishness. Come on, just go along. Look at all the lives you could touch if you just complied. Look at everybody that God could use you to minister to, that all the people in that community, all the people in that nation, if you would just comply, if you just this one time would do this, then everybody would see that you love them and you love God. Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. You, you, you see here in the text, we... We see in verse 16 that they are settled on this. They are absolutely settled. No, no, the boys, can you hear them? The boys? Listen. I know there's probably been a mistake. Let's, let's just give you one more time right now. Y'all in tune over here? Are, are you ready? A one and a two. No, hey. We don't need any time to think about this. No, no, just let them get warmed up again and they'll play. And you, we don't need any of that time. Play, play, play. The answer was no then. Their answer is now, no, no now. The answer will always be no. We will not serve or bow to anyone but the Lord. Not to you. Not to your gods. We will only serve Him. They are settled in their faith. We do not need time to huddle up and converse about this. We do not need to, to, to take a poll about this. We, 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 we do not need to, 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 to worry about any of this. No, listen, we are settled on this matter. We don't need time to think about it. The answer is absolutely no. No committees needed. No, we don't need another night to sleep on it. We don't need another time, another moment to take another breath about this. The answer is no. We are not going to live for anyone but the Lord. They had already had a revival meeting. They had already had a come to Jesus meeting. They had already settled the matter. They, 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 were, they were, had bedrock faith here. They, they, understand this, friend. There are too many people spending too much time trying to make up their mind if they're going to do, not just do right or wrong, but what they're going to do the best. Honor the Lord regardless. Follow after Him. Pursue after Him. Honor Him in public, yes, but in private also. With our lives, but also with our lips. On social media, at the gas station, at the restaurant. Honor Jesus. Exalt the name of the Lord Jesus. Just make much of Him with your life. That doesn't mean be arrogant about it. That doesn't mean be crass about it. That means simply, humbly, graciously, lovingly, pursuing after the Lord Jesus Christ. Exalting Him. There's one this one thing I do, this one thing I live for, and it's all about the Lord. It's all about Him. And they didn't have to look 
to each other that they didn't have to look at Nebuchadnezzar and, 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 and say, you know what? Uh, give us just a second. What do you think we're going to do? What do you think we'll do? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it sounds appealing, but I mean, I know what we've always done, what we've always been taught. I mean, I said, maybe this one time. There is not a scintilla of a moment, not even a nanosecond. The answer is no. They are settled in their faith. The other thing is they are strong in their faith. Notice verse 17. It says, our God. Whom we serve is able. Their God who had done what? Spoke it all into existence. In the beginning God. Their God the one that had parted the Red Sea. Their God the one that had given them the law. Their God that they had watched other people rebel against Him. And to take the benefits and blessings of God. But didn't truly know God. They're not pretending about this. They are settled in their faith. They are strong in their faith. They say this. Listen, man, I'm telling you this. You better understand something. Our God is that God and He is able. He is able to deliver you. Who's going to deliver us out of your hand? He's going to deliver us out of your hand. Time out. Do you understand something? Do you get what they're saying here? Our God is able to make this not happen. They are settled on this. You, you want to know, Nebuchadnezzar, who's going to deliver us out of your hand? You're not in control of this. That's what they're getting at, right? You're not in control of this. You're not Lord. Jesus is Lord. You're not God. God is God. You, you, you just a man just like all of us. You just have a different position. You're a sinner like us. You are in need of a Savior. You need to repent, in other words. They understood what the psalmist said. Call unto me on the day of trouble. I will deliver you. I, I will. That's God's word. You can take that to the bank. Our God is able. Wanted to put it this way. Have faith in God. You ever heard that? Have faith in God. He's on the throne. Have faith in God. He watches over His own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He is able to deliver us. They're settled in it. They're strong in it. But get this. They're steadfast in it. They don't waver. They don't waver. Because how does the next verse start in verse 18? What does it say? Somebody tell me. What's the first three words? But if not. Hey, I want you to know, Neb, right? I want you to know, King Nebuchadnezzar, understand this, sir, that our God is able to deliver us out of your hand. To stop this from happening. But if not. But if He chooses not to deliver us out of the fire, we still will not, we still will not bow. They do not have a faith a trust, a belief in God that says this. If God does this, then we'll follow Him. No, they have a faith in God that says even if God, no matter what God, we are going to live for Him, we are going to serve Him, we are going to honor Him, we are going to exalt Him, we will not bow. We are only going to trust the Lord. We are only going to follow Him. Why? Because they understand something. God is able, but even if He does not deliver them in the way that they would like to or all of us would like to at times, can I get a witness? Amen. It does not change the fact that He is God. It does not change the fact that He is able. It does not change the fact that He doesn't know what He's doing. It doesn't change the fact as well that he's not doing a work either way. Just because, listen to me, give me your eyes, give me your ears. Just because things are hard and are not easy does not mean God is not with you and he is not blessing you.
they understand our God is able to deliver us and make this not happen. But even if he does not do that, guess where they're going? Anybody? God will deliver us out of it or God will deliver us to himself in it. He has not abandoned them. And precious friend, he has not abandoned you. Even this is their sanctification. Even this is their growth. Even this is an opportunity in this moment, even through this that is painful, that, 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 is, that is dire straits, that is potentially death and hard, this is an opportunity for them to grow in Christ and to live for Christ. Let's hit that pause button and let's come over here to my life and let me understand and let me and all of us remember Whatever that is, that's not downplaying it. This is real. This is painful. This is potentially whatever it is. But God is able. But even if not, He is still with us. He still has us. And this is even an opportunity to do what? To grow in Him. To live for Him. But what if deliverance from this here on this earth never comes? It may not. But even if. Or only if. You and I have to make a decision. Are we going to try to headlock God and hold Him hostage and say, Lord, I will live for you and serve you only if. Or Lord, even if you are good and you are faithful and you have me and I am going to trust you. Man, Matt, I, I, I was doing good and I was trying to do that, but man, I've fallen again. Welcome to sanctification. I'm glad I'm to hear that I'm not the only one. Every single one of us in this room carries something. None of us have it all together. But we serve a God, if you know Jesus, that has all things together. He knows absolutely what he's doing. Well, I just wish that God would. Yes. Yes. But even if, he still could. He, he, he's still able. And what is he doing? He is not just working in you and on you. He's working through you. And you are a mirror. You are a picture to other people. Have you ever met someone? And man, it just seems like their life is, is like just... Have you ever met someone and it just seems like everything is going wrong? And man, they, and you watch them and they're just like this. They're just like, man, God is good. And I just can't understand. And you're going, what is wrong with you? Are you real? You know, are you, are you AI or something like that? You, you know what I'm talking about? I, I, my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law has had, had, had cancer over 15 times. And here she is. And she just continuously just serves the Lord. Does she get discouraged? Absolutely. Does she understand? No. But she keeps on serving the Lord. And I'm just like, Lord, thank you. My dad, when I was five years old, was almost killed. And I've watched him over the years. I, 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 I've seen other people. I have a friend that he's going through so many different bouts with his health and mental health and things like that. And here he is. And he and he's like, Matt, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I can't do this in and of myself. But God has been so faithful. Yeah, things are hard. But God has still got me. He's still faithful. Pause. Look right here for me. God still has you. God still has me. He has not forgotten us. He has not forsaken us. What will we do in the midst of this? The enemy wants to draw a line in the sand and you're going to toe that line to serve the Lord Jesus and he will punch you in the mouth and say, back off. Listen to me. You are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus as Lord, not him. Keep following Christ. Keep running the race. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Here's a question I've got to ask me. Am I pursuing Christ like that? Am I pursuing Christ in this manner, in this way, where that I'm seeking to, no matter what, just be faithful and honor Him? You know what I believe? I'm looking at some men and women who love the Lord Jesus, and you're here and you're trying. That's what you want to do. Listen to me. It's not us holding on to Him if we're going to win out in the end. And if we just faith, no, white knuckle it, if we just be faithful, then God will accept us. And God, will, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Push, 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 pause. Look right here. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. Your hope is not in you and your hope is not in me. Your hope is in Christ. But look around you right here. You have brothers and sisters in Christ that you have locked shields with. They are forever faith family with you. They pray for you. They care for you. They love you. They are united. Don't flee that. Flee to Christ with one another. With fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that... Where, where do you see that? Shadrach wasn't by himself. Meshach wasn't by himself. Abednego wasn't by himself. And look around you, neither are you. But even if, but even if Shadrach was by himself, he wasn't by himself. Even if Meshach was by himself, he wasn't by himself. Even if Abednego was by himself, he wasn't by himself. Why do you say that, Matt? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at this rest of the text. Verse 19 says, And then Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and the form of his, of his face, form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one, uh, seven times more than it, than it had been to, to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast him in the burning fiery furnace. And then these men were bound in their coats, their rope, their, their hose, or, or their, uh, their belt, and, and, and their hats, and their other garments. And there they were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Do you, do you see this picture? So this furnace is like, oh, you know, now it's just like, blazing hot. And these most mighty men of his, that Matthew, that, that he takes him and they throw them in there and the Bible says that the mightiest, the strongest men, they fall down dead just being there. But the next verse, notice what it says about them. Notice what it says about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fire furnace. The previous verse says that they fell down and died. It slew them. Verse 23 says they just fell down. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste. And spake and he said, uh, he said to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Of the fire? And they answered, uh, said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and he said, Look, I, I, I see four men though loose. They didn't just fall down. They're, they're loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. They're, they're, they're not just, they've not fallen down. They're up walking, and there is no harm on their body. And notice what he says. And the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the fiery furnace, and he spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. He changes his tune, doesn't he? Come forth and come hither, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst, and the princes, governors, captains, and kings, counselors began being gathered together, saw these men upon their bodies. The fire had no power, nor was there any hair of their head burned or singed, neither were their coats changed, and nor the smell of fire or smoke was passed upon them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You have the force behind the fire. You have their faith for the fire. But did you notice something else there? Is that friends and the fellowship waiting on them in the fire? Everyone else was against them. But Jesus was with them. 
This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what theologians would call a Christophany. Did you notice what he did not do? He did not come and take them out of the fire. No, as a matter of fact, he was in the fire waiting on them when they got in the fire. Our God is able. But if not, you see, Jesus didn't come to get you out of trouble. He came to get into trouble with you. Things may not get better here, but this is not home. But why are these all these problems? Because this is a sin-cursed world. And we live in the midst of a dark day and a dark day. And whenever that they hear and have the compassion and the companionship of their Savior with them there, did you notice the only thing that fell off of them was what Nebuchadnezzar had put on them? The bonds. They were safe in the arms of the Lord Jesus. May I remind all of us, we are safe in the arms of the Lord Jesus. Outside of the fire, in the midst of the fire, we're a winner either way. Just be faithful. Be faithful. Do you notice what takes place and what happens because they do not bend, they do not bow? We have a recorded example of what it looks like to live in the midst of fire. We have a recorded example of what it looks like and a reminder for us that here we are looking here and now that our Savior never leaves us or forsakes us. We also have a recorded example of what? What happens in the life of sinners is conviction comes whenever that we live for Christ and just be faithful. Nebuchadnezzar then does what? He says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Later on, he's going to get sideways again, but then the Word of God says that he repents. Sometimes it takes some people a little longer, doesn't it? But aren't you glad the Lord doesn't give up on us? Listen, you are a living testimony. The question is this, is where is that testimony pointing to? Is it pointing to the greatness and glory and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it cowering, living just for self? There was a man who came to Christ. He loved the Lord. Brilliant. At age 19, he began writing down a list of things. And over the next year in his life, by the time he turned 20, he had written down some 70 thoughts. He called them resolutions. His name was Jonathan Edwards. And he pinned these things down and he said that, that what he would do is every week he would read over these things and reflect on these things. And he said, being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly entreat him by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions so as far as they are agreeable to his will and for his word's sake. And he said, resolved to do whatever I can to bring glory to God for my good and the profit and pleasure of him for my entire life. Resolved to never do any manner or thing, whether in soul or body, less or more, but what tends to the glory of God, no be, nor be, nor suffer it, if I can even avoid it. Resolve to live with all of my might while I do live for the glory of God. Resolve never to do anything simply out of revenge. Resolve never to suffer the least motions of anger to irrational beings resolved when I feel pain to think of the pains of the martyrdom and of hell resolved are we resolved tonight to 
to live for the glory of God? Or are we resolved to compromise and cower? Do you know him? Do you know Christ? If not, you have no greater need than to know Jesus tonight. If not, you are the enemy of God tonight. But God calls you and invites you to become and be family tonight. If you will believe in the Lord Jesus, confess to Him that you are a sinner, and ask Him in repentance and faith to forgive your sin and save you, He will know Christ.